it is the, by orders of magnitude, the biggest crisis the airline industry has ever seen. Nobody thought that we'd get to a stage where 95% of all world aviation was essentially grounded. COVID-19 has thrown economies into recession and overturned modern assumptions about the ease of and access to travel. We had 9,000 passengers a day coming through and now we're lucky if we get a dozen. It couldn't have fallen off more or more quickly. You know, we've had flights with uh, more dogs on them than passengers in the last couple of weeks. Nothing like this has happened before in the airline industry. The impact has been dramatic. It's been vicious. Around the world, airlines were pushed to the brink. And here in Australia, Virgin became the first big corporate casualty. The magnitude of the problem just fell on us. The skies were effectively closed. So you have a big capital intensive industry with a lot of people and you have no revenue. Our revenue went down to a very, very low number very, very quickly. The future of flying is now in question. Initially, people are going to be much more nervous about flying. I think domestically, we'll probably find in Australia, if we can keep clean, as it were, that people will get a lot more relaxed fairly quickly. Internationally, it'll be a different thing. Ask anyone in this business, there's something intoxicating about the smell of Avgas. But behind the romance and the glamour is a fiercely competitive industry, where success is measured not just by profit, but also by power, influence and connections. Virgin has been flying here for nearly 20 years, but within a week of the COVID shutdown, it was all but dead. Tonight on Four Corners, what was really behind the collapse of Virgin Australia? Why did the government refuse to step in to save it? And what is the future for Australian aviation? business world, they call these black swan events. Difficult to predict and widespread and devastating in their impact. From 30,000 feet, the airline industry had a bird's eye view of what was coming. We had, I think, Australia's first case of a COVID or someone diagnosed with COVID flying on a plane on one of our Tiger aircraft. That caused a lot of press. Uh, and it just ramped up from there. We were really surprised at how fast this moved because nobody um, were, was expecting that by the time we got to March, we were going to see the borders closing down very rapidly, internationally and domestically. The world began shutting down. Once bustling airports emptied, the skies fell silent. I think the, the aha moment for me was watching Jacinta Ardern announce that they were completely shutting their borders. We are expecting that to happen. Off the back of that, uh, our government followed pretty quickly. Uh, but then the state government stepped in off the back of advice from the federal government that non-essential domestic travel should be something that people uh, don't undertake. Uh, so that was probably the, the point where I thought we were in all sorts of trouble from a financial perspective. What we immediately did was to pull our costs down. So we stood down about 80% of our staff. We stopped our international flights. We initially pulled down our domestic flights to about 50% of what they were and then way down to just skeleton, skeleton flights to try and eliminate all the costs we possibly could. You immediately saw the standing down of tens of thousands of workers who were working one day and not the next. It's not just the direct employees of the airlines, there's so many other jobs in the supply chain. So the flow on effect has been enormous. Thousands and thousands of workers have lost their jobs. Aviation is the lifeblood of the economy. It's the arteries of the economy that facilitates the carrying on of business and the transport of people for, for work and for leisure and of all of our goods. Um, so it is, it's an extraordinary thing to now have that shut down. Virgin was extremely vulnerable. It entered the new COVID era saddled with billions of dollars of debt. 
they were always going to have to uh, perhaps restructure, perhaps refinance their business. They had uh, considerable debt coming into COVID-19. And of course, when you've got that lead in your saddlebags, it, it is difficult uh, to continue to operate as a company, any company, let alone in a company with, uh, uh, you know, in an aviation sector where the margins are always tight at the best of times. Always going to be difficult. When the board sat and looked at it, and looked at the fact that this was going to be three or four months of no revenue, it became very apparent to us that we weren't going to get to the other side of this chasm without some government support. On March 12, after failing to get extra cash from its shareholders, Virgin made its first case to the government for financial help. I write to you to request the support and assistance of the Australian Government to enable the Virgin Australia Group to respond to the rapidly escalating impacts of the COVID-19 crisis. We wanted to get to government early to make sure that they understood that we had exhausted the discussions with shareholders. By the time we were talking to government, uh, we wanted them to understand that there were other potential sources of capital, but we'd exhausted the discussions and we had to go to government for help. $4.9 billion worth that we can secure finance. Qantas had little sympathy for Virgin's predicament, publicly urging the government not to bail it out. When good companies have managed their position very well, uh, the government should let them manage their way through this and not look after the badly managed companies uh, that have been badly managed for 10 years, that have resulted in them being very weak. Picking winners and losers like that is not what the government is about. It shouldn't be what the Australian government is about. It shouldn't be what this economy is about. Why did you come out so hard at that time? So, so we were talking to the government, I think, as all the airlines were, about an industry package and for very much for the government to support the entire industry and not to pick winners or losers. And the government always had the mantra that there were sector-wide, industry-wide and economy-wide initiatives. And if, if you start picking out individual companies, giving them a bigger benefit, and Virgin were asking for $1.4 billion, and that was three times their market cap. It was essentially a nationalisation of Virgin I would have lent, led to. And that could distort the market and create unfair competition into the future. It is a moral hazard, and people are very reluctant. A lot of companies, a lot of business leaders are very com uh, uncomfortable with the government getting involved in industries to an individual company level, sector-wide, industry-wide, is something that we all support. What did you think of Alan Joyce's comments at the beginning of this whole process? Yeah, look, I've always admired Alan's fighting spirit uh, and uh, why he said those comments, you'd have to ask him. My view here was that, uh, you know, if two AFL teams turned up to the MCG and the ground was ruined, they'd... Uh, they'd join arms and help fix the ground before they go back on the ground and beat each other up. And that's the circumstances I felt we were in. Virgin promised to repay the $1.4 billion. If it failed to do so, the government could take a stake in the airline. We weren't asking for a bailout. We were asking for an ostensibly Australian company that did have foreign ownership to be rescued and possibly taken back into Australian ownership through the mechanism we were talking about. We are asking for something that was repayable and that we could find a way to repay. Eight letters to the government in all saw the Virgin request whittled down to just $200 million. The government was divided over whether or not to bail out Virgin. I think there was different levels of support for us around the cabinet table. So I think some of the encouragement came from those who philosophically believed we should be supported. And uh, we clearly didn't have the balance of the vote uh, around the cabinet table. And so there was some mixed signals coming out. I think probably they felt that there was more than one path, that there was one path which, which involved government help to bridge the chasm to post COVID. And there was another path that says, well, let's throw all the balls up in the air and see what the market does and see what it comes out with. The airline made a last desperate plea on April 20. Without this support, Virgin Australia will likely move into voluntary administration during the course of Monday 20 April. The government refused to help. Virgin Australia is a very good airline performing a very important role. 
And this is a difficult day for its staff, for its suppliers, and for the aviation sector more broadly. But the government was not going to bail out five large foreign shareholders with deep pockets who together own 90% of this airline. I knew at that point that we were on our own uh, and I knew at that point that uh, we had a, a long road ahead of us. Uh, you know, we were all tired. Uh, we'd all been working around the clock, you know, seven days a week, you know, 15 to 18 hour days, uh, trying to avoid going into voluntary administration. And I think that was sort of the confirmation that any assistance from government uh, wasn't going to be forthcoming. So, Mr McCormick, why did the government reject Virgin's plea for a cash injection? What we did was sector-wide assistance, so the whole way along. And, of course, the aviation sector was hit first and hit hardest through COVID-19, but the whole way through, we've always made our assistance sector-wide. And so Virgin has benefited from the sector-wide assistance that we have provided. So I'll be very quick. I'm going to move on. Matt Canavan is one regional politician who thinks the government should have stepped in to support Virgin and competition across the network. I think it's a, a potential tragedy for regional Australia to not have a viable second alternative uh, for flights. I would have hoped that we could have avoided Virgin going into administration. Uh, look, we are where we are, though, and, and my focus now is on... On, on trying to support a viable uh, alternative operator in regional areas, because without a viable alternative operator, uh, we, uh, we face a significant increase in prices, uh, effectively a, a tax on doing business and being a business uh, in regional and country towns. Our board made a very courageous decision last night to put the company into voluntary administration and do so quickly. Uh, with the intent of working with our administrator, Deloitte, uh, to come through and be as strong as we possibly can on the other side of this crisis. So what this tells us is that the Australian government was not prepared to do what is good for this country, because in a country as large as ours, where there's so many people in isolated regional rural communities, the notion that it's not good public policy for government to have a stake in an airline, I completely reject. The government's decision was seen as a win for Qantas. I think Qantas have had a strategy for a long time where they want to exert maximum influence in the interest of their airline only. What we have here is a government that seemed to listen far too much to one company that has a direct interest in becoming a monopoly. And that's what's wrong about the government's response. Qantas has got a a proud place as our, our national airline, uh, support that continuing. Uh, I think the idea that it would try and use this as an opportunity to stamp out competition and establish itself once again as a monopoly in some places was a little uncalled for and disappointing, given its proud history as a national airline. I mean, we're talking about a company that was government owned and, and supported for, for many, many years. The, the position Qantas is in is at least in part uh, a reflection of long-term government involvement and investment. Uh, so I found it a little opportunistic uh, for Qantas to be trying to take advantage of this, this terrible situation. There are clearly there are some critics of you speaking out so hard at that time, as I'm sure you're aware, and a lot of people point to Qantas' influence in the market yeah. here uh, and influence with the government, of course. Do you have undue influence in the market? No, I mean, we, we are very much in a very open market here, one of the most open aviation markets in the world. Uh, we never saw that there was going to be a position where Qantas would have a monopoly. That's not good for Qantas. That's not good for, uh, for our shareholders. That's not good for our customers. That's not good for our employees. Virgin entered the tumultuous and fiercely competitive world of Australian aviation back in 2000 as a brash, colourful budget carrier. Right, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we were going to either be a screaming success or a big failure, and so we had to take a punt, and that's why we just looked at how the model was and said every single element, as I said, had to be reinvented.
Well, when I first joined Virgin, it was Virgin Blue, and it was a relatively small airline. A great place to work. Everyone knew everyone. It was a very friendly environment to work. It was a party culture, but under underlying that was a very, very sound foundation for the operation. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to finish off the flight with some aerobics, just to get the blood circulating. People love the culture and the sass about the brand. And squeeze the buttocks gently for a few seconds. And so I think for us it was, the model was very important, the low cost model was, was exceptionally important, but the brand was a shield, it allowed us to hit the market. As you recall there was another airline that launched a couple of weeks before us, Impulse, and, um, and it was a fine airline, uh, but it didn't have the awareness of the brand and we didn't have to spend that money uh, coming, coming into the market. The arrival of Virgin Blue disrupted what had been a comfortable and complacent industry. A disruption that would contribute to the biggest corporate failure in Australian aviation, the collapse of ANSET. I was back in Australia visiting family and friends when ANSET collapsed or the day it collapsed. All these people were just absolutely devastated. They were quite inebriated, a lot of them, and uh, very upset and crying and very, very emotional. Deborah Laurie has seen her fair share of turbulence. She was the first female pilot for a major Australian airline. She flew for ANSET, for almost 10 years. Its failure would rewrite Australian aviation. There's always somebody out there that's going to try and enter the market. So when ANSET collapsed, I think most people thought that some, someone or some company would come into that, to that hole in the market. We saw the opportunity with ANSET gone that we could probably grow to about 25, maybe 30% of the market over the course of three to five years. And so we, we genuinely believe that was a, that was a, a good opportunity. Um, and so we pursued it. So that meant we had to change our model a little bit. In the end, we introduced um, seating up the front. We launched long haul carriers. We flew to more destinations, regional centres. So we went away from the pure low cost model to start to position ourselves to be a second player in the market. Um, we made a billion dollars in 10 years and we gave back probably about $350 million to shareholders and still did, did pretty well, I think. I think Virgin, uh, when they first started, found that niche, had a really good niche that was very profitable. There's definitely a place here for two operators to make a lot of money. And we showed that during Virgin's initial 10 years, Qantas and Virgin both made a significant returns for their shareholders during that period of time. And there's no doubt in my mind that the market could support two very healthy players here. Qantas responded to the arrival of Virgin by launching its own budget carrier, Jetstar. It was the genesis of Jetstar because Virgin, Virgin Blue as it was then, as a very low cost operation, totally transformed the Australian market and it really started to hurt Qantas. Qantas could see that it was going to die, basically, um, but it, uh, they very quickly moved to insert Jetstar in there and that put a, stunted the, uh, the Virgin Blue growth. In 2010, a new CEO, John Borghetti, came to Virgin from Qantas with a plan to take on Qantas at its own game. Borghetti had been in the running to become Qantas CEO. The board chose Alan Joyce instead. Like I won the Olympics. Obviously, there was considerable rivalry, and John felt that he probably should have got the Qantas CEO role. But, you know, a lot of, lot of water passed under the bridge after that, and... Uh, it was much more a focus, I think, on, on the market itself. Um, I think probably if the antagonism was sort of balanced out, probably Alan was, was more antagonistic towards John as he saw him trying to, to compete. The battle between John Borghetti and Alan Joyce came to be viewed as an epic and very personal feud. At Virgin, Borghetti set about pursuing what he called his game change strategy to take on Qantas. It would spark an aggressive and expensive capacity war unlike anything the Australian aviation industry had ever seen. 
I think what happened was Virgin wanted to pursue Qantas in all segments, which I, I disagreed with, just still disagree with, and play, I guess, duopoly 101 against them on that basis. Um, I wasn't in the boardroom. Um, I wasn't part of the management for the last 10 years. And so I, I honestly am not going to call out whether it was right or wrong, just saying there's, it, it got out of sync somewhere. When Brett Godfrey um, left the company and John Borghetti took over, um, he, he had a vision for the airline and he created a great airline. We've got, we've got to give him credit. He really created a great product and a great airline. And with that came a cost, and the cost was the accumulated debt. Action! I remember saying, I want this commercial to be big. I want it big. Think big and then think bigger because big is not big enough. And there is A lot's no... made of the apparent rivalry between John Borghetti and yourself. Mm. Clearly you got the big job that some say he was after. What do you make of that? How much of that was in play at this time? Well, for us, it was never um, personal. It was always about business. And, you know, we were quite happy uh, for, for Qantas to make money and Virgin to make money if that's what a competitive market actually had. Uh, but for us, it was also protecting our territory. I never made it, but I know I did take some Borghetti pushed aggressively into the top end of the Qantas market with more business class and an exclusive club lounge. He leased new wide-body jets and, in an attempt to cleave off some of Qantas's market share, dramatically increased capacity. More planes, more seats. It quickly developed into a price war. He lost sight a bit of the, the bottom line, the cost line, because he was driven by the desire to, um, particularly to attack the corporate market. And, but again, you know, I guess in retrospect it's easy, he should have perhaps recognised that Qantas was going to fight back with every tool at its, dis at its disposal, which it did very aggressively. Virgin certainly, I think, was um, hell-bent on getting market share, but, you know, you can't... You've got to be able to afford it. You have to be able to afford going into those things. And in the end, deep pockets win, and Qantas is the deep pocket, not Virgin. Feud delivered cheaper flights, but cost the airlines billions. Virgin's finances were hemorrhaging. As soon as I started to understand my way around the numbers and where it all worked out, it was very clear to me that the company was over leveraged and that it needed a capital raise. Through these actions, we are targeting sustainable earnings growth. Elizabeth Bryan became chair of the Virgin Board in 2015, five years after John Borghetti was appointed CEO. So thank you for your attention to my address. And I'll now ask our chief executive, John Borghetti, to address the meeting. He has been somewhat of a divisive figure, uh, but he also has a lot of supporters. So I, we shouldn't underestimate that for many, many years, John Borghetti was the face of Virgin. And John Borghetti did build Virgin, and he did build a good airline. He did not build a good enough business. And I think, I think it's because of not building a good enough business uh, that he's faced, faced this criticism. People, people expect those things to go hand in hand, and life is much easier if they do. When I arrived uh, at the airline, a lot of frontline staff said, look, can we please stop trying to be like Qantas? Because you're never gonna, Qantas is a great airline, you're never gonna beat Qantas at Qantas's game. John Thomas was Virgin's group executive. Whilst it was great to move up market into a full service carrier, we should have done it in a uniquely Virgin Australia way, rather than necessarily trying to copy Qantas uh, uh, toe for toe. John Borghetti left in March 2019. In the end, a CEO runs the operations of a company and not a board. And what the board can do if they don't like the way the CEO is running the company is to change the CEO. And that's eventually what the board that I led did. Um, not it was not uh, 
prematurely. It, it, it was not done in an undignified fashion. I think all parties, including John, knew that he'd, he'd put in long time and long year and long, long hours running Virgin. And I think, you know, I think he'd done his stuff and the board thought it was time for a change. And so that's, that's, when, that's when a board changes out its CEO. And whilst at the same time we were... John Borghetti would not agree to an on-camera interview, but he did tell Four Corners that he first flagged leaving the company in 2016, but stayed on for another three years at the request of the chair. You're up and back? Yes, just a return, yep. Paul Scurra stepped into the CEO's role last year. What have you spent your time doing? The bones of a great Elon are here, uh, and I saw that there was a very profitable core uh, and the plan was to simplify, make us more efficient, clear up duplication in the structure and, and come out the other side with uh, a business that would have paid down the debt, would have had a stronger balance sheet and would have been a stronger competitor. Yeah, there's a lot of businesses going but the turnaround yeah. didn't happen fast enough. I think uh, what became obvious to me is that the balance sheet wasn't as strong as it should be. It was something that was vulnerable, I think, to a black swan event. Uh, we often talked about our plans addressing that balance sheet to get us into a stronger position should something like COVID come along. And it came along much sooner than, well, we'd never want it to come along, but it came along much sooner than uh, we were ready for. Given the unprecedented shutdown of aviation around the world, Virgin's foreign shareholders said they were in no position to help bail them out. There was the opportunity, of course, uh, uh, for uh, the foreign owners of, uh, of various airlines to uh, provide assistance, to uh, stump up. It shouldn't just be the taxpayers of Australia. Our foreign shareholders were all airline companies. They were all facing the same problems. They were all dependent on their own country governments to, to save their domestic businesses. There was no way they could take take any money they had access to and put it into an investment in Australia. Their view was that their country governments were helping support their airline industry and our country government should help support our airline industry. But either way, support or not, they, they were under no illusion that they had any significant value left in their equity. The government maintains it does want to see a competitive airline sector and has introduced what it says is a broad support package worth more than $1.2 billion. Both Virgin and Qantas say the assistance package isn't quite as generous as it might seem. There is $715 million that is related to the initial aviation package. The way that was designed, people thought they were going to be flying a lot more, and it was reduction in air services charges and fuel excise. And the reality, as we talked about, because the network became so small, um, people haven't seen that come true. And we've gotten a very small proportion of that, less than 100 million. You only get that benefit if you're flying. And when we became almost grounded, like Qantas did as well, uh, it was of no benefit. The COVID pandemic hasn't been all bad for everyone. In fact, one of the smaller players in the Australian skies has done pretty well out of it. While the government refused to entertain Virgin's final plea for a $200 million loan, it did find more than $80 million in grants for Rex Airlines. Rex is also substantially foreign owned, but unlike Virgin, it's a small regional carrier with a big political footprint. Can we go back to Rex and, you know, what some say has been the favourable treatment that Rex has been given by the government? What do you say about that? Well, I don't see Rex as having been given favourable treatment by the government. What I see is the government's given favourable treatment to the regional communities that Rex services. The Honorary John Sharp, who is the Deputy Chairman of Regional Express. Yeah, Alison. John Sharp is the Deputy Chairman of Rex Airlines. He's also a former National Party Treasurer and a former Transport Minister. In 1997, I privatised these airports and... Uh, it's not John Sharp asking the government to give us money. It's about the government looking at how to provide a service, an essential service in many cases, to regional communities around Australia via regional airlines. And that's what they're supporting. They're not just supporting John Sharp, they're supporting regional communities. You will be aware of, obviously, the charges of cronyism, given that John Sharp is the Rex deputy chairman. He's also a former federal treasurer of the National Party. What do you say to those people? I don't think any inference can be drawn from that. 
None at all? None. Why not? I mean, people look at it and say there are connections, yet they're getting favourable treatment. Well, I, I get on well with Paul Scurra, I get on well with Alan Joyce. A lot of people point to the political connections between Rex and the government. Do you think that may have had some influence? Well, if I could have found out what it was, I would have bottled it and used it for virgin. Well, I think uh, one of the things I've learnt through this is that we, um, we didn't have the deep ties into Canberra that other parties in this industry have. Uh, so that's something we would um, find as a disadvantage uh, looking backwards. Uh, I can't comment on John's uh, involvement with the National Party, uh, you know, if he's been able to... Uh, to get an outcome more favourable for Rex, um, then good luck to him. But um, from our perspective, uh, if he was able to do that, we would ask for proportionate support as well, which, uh, uh, which we're still asking for. Rex has seized the moment and announced it is looking to raise more money to take on Virgin and Qantas in the lucrative capital city market. We see fresh opportunities arising as a result of the difficulties that Virgin's found themselves in. And so we see some regional uh, routes there that we could possibly move into. And also we see Rex as having the opportunity to expand potentially into other parts of aviation. And we've already announced that we have uh, an interest in looking at um, developing uh, inter-capital city uh, airline services. You know, I think they went from being the only airline in the world on the brink of bankruptcy to announcing expansion plans during COVID, um, which I think uh, for most of us was disappointing to see. Uh, we don't object to the sector getting support at all. Uh, we just wanted it to be fair across uh, all parties. At the end of the day, if someone wants to buy most of it, I think we have to take that outcome. With Virgin grounded, CEO Paul Scurra has been working with the administrator Vaughan Strawbridge to find a buyer. They have been briefing staff online throughout the process. Absolutely worth throwing everything I possibly can at saving the airline, which is my immediate focus and I'm, I'm, that's my obsession. Um, I'm a bit fatalistic about whether or not I'll be the one going forward. I'd love to, there's no, no doubt about that at all. Um, I think there's a lot of tough decisions to be made. Well, I think there's a, a number of reasons to save Virgin. Uh, first of all, the economy needs it. Uh, the tourism industry is, is desperately needing a robust stream of passengers coming to as many of our tourism destinations as possible. And that just isn't possible with a monopoly situation or a much reduced uh, second airline. Uh, I also think it's well worth saving because we do increase the quality of the product in this country by what we do. And I think everyone wins from that. Uh, and lastly, I think the people here are well worth fighting for. One thing which we're spending a lot of time with the bid is, and they want to understand the, you know, the speed of the ramp up, what can be done to assist them as the COVID restrictions come through. Um, really important to us is, is how is the government feeling about that? What things is the government going to do to help? Eight initial expressions of interest were gradually reduced to two. On Friday, US private equity firm Bain Capital was announced as the buyer. Bain has a plan for a scaled back virgin pitched somewhere between Jetstar and Qantas. I think one of the consequences of going through the process we're going through and ending up with new owners uh, in a leaner form is that we will fly to less places. Um, there is zero doubt about that and where we've withdrawn from those routes, uh, it's likely to create, in those, those circumstances, specifically for those routes, a monopoly situation. So uh, we're conscious of that. Uh, we'd rather not have that impact on the travelling public. There are around 9,000 employees who form one of the largest creditor groups. The unions have put the new owner on notice already that any attempts to scale back the workforce will be resisted. Jobs are critical, they're always critical, but coming out of this pandemic and the likely impact on the economy now more than ever. We want to make sure that the buyer has a plan for a viable airline and a viable airline industry. We don't want short-term tyre kickers. We don't want people who are going to grab the money and run and we're back in this situation again in a couple of years. 
the new owner of Virgin can be in no doubt that they will face unrelenting competition from Qantas. It's very, very difficult, uh, especially when there's not a level playing field. I mean, Qantas wield enormous uh, political power and um, essentially unfair, really, for any other competitors in the market. I think we have to make competition fair in this country. Qantas is always going to be a strong competitor. We're always going to try and reinvent ourselves. We're always going to try and survive and thrive. The Qantas dominance of the market is something that's, that's very hard to address. And what you'll try to do as a new virgin is to reduce your costs as much as possible. Um, that is extremely difficult. Qantas says it aims to have 40% of its network back in the air by the end of July and domestic travel back to 90% by the end of the year. Alan Joyce is prepared to offer almost any price to get his planes flying again, selling Jetstar fares as low as $19. We have 220 aircraft stuck on the ground at the moment. We're burning through $40 million a week. Uh, we need to get that burned down to survive. Obviously, not everything on the aircraft is going to be $19, but isn't that the right business decision to do? And isn't it right for the tourism sector? And isn't it right for the business sector to get those clogs and those wheels actually moving? This is not put through the lens of anything to do with Virgin. This is always the lens of what's good to try and make sure that Quanta survives this. I know you have you sorted out the sea problem. I thought we were going to start putting stuff in. We're the still seat. working still through that. Still. Qantas clearly has extraordinary power in this market, and in an attempt to prevent any anti competitive behaviour, the government has directed the ACCC to monitor and report on the domestic aviation industry. When are school holidays in um, New South Wales? We don't fear competition, but what's happened to our sector here has given a, a, a few years of real uncertainty around what the market might do, and I think it's in the government's best interest, the economy's best interest, to make sure that there is a role that they play that preserves the most competitive airline industry as they can as we come out of it in the next two to three years. We as a government are working to do just that and will continue uh, to, of course, uh, play a part in making sure that we provide the necessary assistance, making sure that we work closely with uh, each and every one of the airlines and making sure that, uh, particularly for those commuters, that they get the best deal possible. So you're saying the parliament, the government, could step in and legislate to make sure that there is a competitive... Well, let's see what happens. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's it's a, a bit of a hypothetical question, saying. but that's what the parliament's for. It's for uh, to work for and on behalf of the people of Australia. So if, if that's necessary, then we'll certainly look at it at the time. COVID-19 has changed many things. Everyone wants to see these terminals looking busy again, but getting people flying will be a challenge. Mentally, philosophically, psychologically, people are going to be concerned about getting back on aeroplanes, whether it's a short haul flight and particularly for long haul flights. Um, and, and that, I think, is the, the biggest barrier we have to overcome. I actually think our biggest competitor is going to be Zoom and Teams and WebEx and Skype. These digital conferencing facilities, I think, will be our biggest competitor in the post-coronavirus period because people in business have discovered that you can actually hold a pretty good business meeting digitally over the screen on your computer or your laptop. The airlines have already warned that social distancing on an aircraft will not be possible. And I have to say, social distancing on an aircraft is not practical anyway. Um, the middle seat is only 60 centimetres. If you were actually to put the four metre squared requirement in on an aircraft, you'd have 22 people on a 180 seat aircraft. And that would make the economics non-viable, or the airfares would have to be nine times what they are today. The industry is optimistic that the domestic market will recover. No one expects we'll be flying overseas again soon. We're talking about a New Zealand bubble with Australia, then a little bit more regional perhaps, and then finally more global. But it's, that's going to be a very gradual process. So even if I do feel like flying in 18 months' time, there's a reasonable chance I'm not going to be able to do it at the sort of price I want to do it, and I probably won't be able to get insurance, and I pretty much probably won't be able to get a vaccination. What I added, the airline industry body is forecasting that demand won't get back to 19 levels until 2023. 
um, maybe at the earliest. And we're seeing other airlines around the globe now adjusting their size to cope with this new world. Air Canada have said they're going to be 50% smaller. Air New Zealand, 30% smaller. British Airways, 25% smaller. Even the carriers in the Middle East, they're 20 to 30% smaller coming out of this. Uh, so we're working through what the size and shape of Qantas into the future is going to be. Last week, Qantas announced more than 6,000 jobs will be lost and 15,000 remain stood down without pay, leaving around 8,000 currently with jobs. The company has also announced it's aiming to raise an extra $1.9 billion from investors to get it through the crisis. It'll be a weaker Australian airline industry and it will not come back quickly. It will come back in baby steps over the next few months, um, possibly years. This has now been a massive reset, so the, there's, each airline around the world, as it recovers, is going to be a lot smaller initially, and it's going to take quite some time for them to grow back to where they were prior to uh, COVID-19. Fewer competitors in the market, uh, particularly on long haul, uh, more expensive and um, obviously more difficult too, because it's not just about um, the price of getting from A to B, it's how you get from A to B. It's going to be more difficult because there are less airlines flying. The flying experience may be different and there could be more turbulence to come, but no one in this industry doubts there is a profitable future for the Australian aviation sector and we will be flying again. This market is, is a profitable market. It, it's one of the more profitable markets in the world for, domestically. And so it should be good for the economy, it should be good for the consumer, and it should be good for the businesses that participate in it if it's, if it's done, done correctly. So we're just having to keep our flexibility open uh, to make sure that we're fitter and leaner coming out of this to cope with a new leaner, a meaner virgin. I am a firm believer that there's room in the Australian domestic airline business for two well-managed airlines. And the question is, well, well-managed, and that's the key to it. I have put five hard years into trying to mould the second airline so it's a stable competitor, it services as Australia, it gives us choice, it gives us prices we can afford. It gives us good service. I think it's really, really important. I would love something equivalent to what Virgin was to come out of this. Uh, I, think, I think that would serve the nation well.